welcome to the second day of the European Hydrogen Research Days. I hope you have been able to attend the first day yesterday, where the overview of the activities of the JU was provided, uh, together with the overview of the portfolio of transport-related projects and others such as uh, hydrogen valleys, uh, clean heat and power, for example. My name is Luca Fela. I am a project officer at the Clean Hydrogen JU. Uh, I'm in charge, together with my colleagues, Lionel Boyo and Pietro Colaprisco, of various transport projects. Uh, and today, I will be moderating this panel on the transport and uses. Uh, in this panel, which will last one hour and a half, there will be six different presenters uh, that they will represent seven different projects. Each presentation is expected to last approximately 10 minutes, uh, and that should leave at the end of this one hour and a half, uh, a Q&A of approximately 20 minutes at the end of the session, where we will also uh, discuss some conclusions of the panel. Uh, I recommend you to, um, to follow it and to pose your questions through Slido. Uh, you can see at the right side of your screen, there should be a button with the different name of the sessions. Please select the one uh, on transport if you want to give some questions on, on this session. Um, you will see that this panel covers all main transport modes. We have projects on cars, uh, trucks, ships, trains, and aircraft. So pretty much all transport modes are covered. Um, I will then now give the floor to the first presenter, so we move into, into the sessions. Uh, and we start with the first project, which is actually a couple of projects combined. Uh, these are H2ME2 and Zephyr. They will present, be presented by Alex Stewart, who is a partner at TRM. Just as an introductory note, these two projects combined have contributed to deploy something like 20% of fuel cell electric vehicles currently running in Europe and 20% of the HRSs which have been deployed in Europe. And Alex will guide us through um, highlighting the success, the challenges and the next actions. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Luca, and thank you very much for the invitation to, to present these two projects. So I'll start with a, a quick overview of, of the projects. Uh, Luca, you, you introduced them very nicely already uh, in terms of the, the scale of the projects and the fact that these were certainly two of the flagship demonstration projects for, for light vehicles at a European level. Um, H2ME2 on the left-hand side um, started in 2015 and is itself a combination of uh, uh, H2ME1 and H2ME2 um, with very similar partners and, and aims. Um, and total project budget of, of over 100 million and, and 35 million from the FCHJU. The focus there was um, demonstration of, of uh, of light vehicles, light hydrogen vehicles, um, in a wide variety of, of uses alongside the deployment of the associated hydrogen refueling infrastructure. And then Zephyr was uh, a project that has run mostly in parallel with H2ME2, um, but with a focus on uh, taxis, uh, as we'll see in a moment. Slightly smaller project, um, around 80 million euros uh, total budget and, and 5 million from the FCHJU. Um, both of these projects are very nearly complete um, as of end of 2023. So H2ME um, and, and, and H2ME2 um, will deploy up to 1,400 FCVs and, and um, over 45 HRS um, across the 10 countries. Um, Almost all of that's been done. Um, there are still a few vehicles that haven't yet been deployed, but but broadly the the expected number of vehicles has has been deployed. You can see um, the green dots on the on the map there showing all of the um, HRS that have been um, commissioned and the orange ones under commissioning to support that fleet of of light vehicles. And there's a mixture of um, passenger cars and uh, fuel cell vans. Um, you can see the the um, 
the different organizations that have supported the the project on the left hand side there and alongside the um demonstration so physically the use of vehicles uh, and infrastructure in the project there have been a wide number of um, studies and analyses conducted looking at the uh, technical and operational performance of the vehicles um the uh customer feedback on on their experiences um, using and, and, and driving the vehicles and using the infrastructure and then various secondary studies for example looking at the role of electrolyzers in grid operation and, and how that can um, help to to um, facilitate the, the deployment of hydrogen mobility and reduce costs for the end user and then Zephyr, uh, again, the project is nearly nearly complete. As I mentioned, this one was focused uh, on taxis, so a particularly intensive use um, for vehicles with high mileages, high numbers of hours of operation per, per day um, that are not uh, particularly well suited to, to battery electric vehicles um, at the, the current level of technology. And in this project, 180 fuel cell vehicles have been deployed um, across um, three capitals, London, Paris, and, and Copenhagen, uh, with 60 each. Um, and then uh, the hydrogen fueling infrastructure, mainly it's based on infrastructure that was already present or being deployed in other projects, um, but with upgrades uh, for, for some, some of the stations and funded by the project. Um, the vehicles have run over 15 million kilometres. Um, since April 2018 um, and have shown uh, very strong performance, as we'll get to in, in a few moments, in terms of meeting the needs of the drivers and the, uh, and the end users, the, the passengers in, in the taxis. So, as I mentioned, we've carried out numerous surveys uh, before, during and after the operation of these vehicles across the two projects. Um, and that's confirmed the uh, very strong performance and uh, customer satisfaction with fuel cell vehicles. Um, the, the reliability of the vehicles has been excellent, um, you know, equal to petrol, diesel or, or battery electric vehicles. Um, the, the drivers and the passengers uh, love the, the um, zero emissions aspect, of course, but also the silence, the smoothness, the, 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 the driving experience of, of these vehicles. Um, and you know, almost universally um, strong feedback on the FCEV side um, in terms of satisfaction and reliability and performance. And of course, the long ranges and, and the quick refueling times that, that are the fundamental um, ad advantage of fuel cell vehicles have been noted, particularly in these taxi operations, where often the drivers don't have access to um, recharging at home um, and, and would find it difficult to use a battery electric vehicle. And um, on the infrastructure side, there have been big improvements throughout the project, addressing a few technical challenges early on, for example, the ability to get a full um, refueling event completed. So to fill the tanks um, to their maximum pressure to, to fully uh, unlock the, the uh, stated range of the vehicles. Those have, have been worked through by the various partners um, and the station reliability has has increase significantly um, throughout that time with numerous stations now operating you know, at 99% at um, availability. Um, it's, it's fair to say, I think, that the, the HRS have been the less reliable than the vehicles. Um, and some of that is due to, to user inexperience or user error. But I think there have been uh, teething problems with these, with, so in some cases, early generations of stations that will need to be improved um, for, for this to be uh, rolled out on a commercial scale and for this to become a, a mainstream technology for, for, for the general public and, and wide varieties of, of fleets. So in terms of the conclusions that we've, we've drawn from, uh, from the, the, the project, I think the projects themselves have been um, highly successful uh, in terms of meeting the, the expectations of the FCHJU and, and, and what the sector needs. So, um, it's confirmed what we all knew that, that, that there is a demand for vehicles with longer ranges and quicker refueling times than, for example, battery electric vehicles, particularly in, in, in the taxi applications. Um, the performance of the vehicles has been, uh, has been excellent. HRS um, has been uh, 
a, a, a work in progress and and um, you know, in, impressive improvements uh, during the project, but still uh, not at the same level, for example, as, as petrol stations across all the different operators. Um, so the project themselves, I think, has been successful. It's clear that the overall um, development of the light vehicle sector for hydrogen mobility has been slower than expected. So when these projects were conceived in 2015, I think everyone would have expected a, a, a rapid shift um, and, and ramp up with second generation vehicles um, and uh, widespread rollout of stations um, where these become a, a, you know, an equal um, alternative technology as alongside battery electric vehicles as we try to decarbonize light mobility. I think it's fair to say that that, that um, exponential curve is still at, at the beginning um, and even the second generation vehicles they have a relatively high cost premium um, and the the stations themselves have been strongly impacted by the um, pandemic in terms of uh, supply chain, uh, uh, spare parts availability and, and things like that. And then, of course, the energy crisis provoked by um, by the war in Ukraine, um, which has had a strong negative impact on, on the hydrogen price. So the third um, box that you see on, on, on this slide it's clear that um, cost reduction is still the key um, as as we move towards the the, the next wave of, of vehicles and stations. The the hydrogen cost has been high um, for the stations, and many of the stations have been um, closed by their operators because they're part of the this early wave of demonstration projects with uh, relatively small capacities that don't scale well and and, and can't provide very low cost hydrogen. Um, in the future, so the operators are are rightly closing those down and, and then um, shifting towards much larger capacity stations. Um, in many cases, that can be shared with heavy and light vehicles to deliver low hydrogen prices in the in the long term. Um, but that, of course, has a short term impact where vehicles might not be able to find the fuel that they need, um, and and uh, yeah, that that can cause some operational um, difficulties during this transition. But there is a pathway and, and a mutualization of the of the heavy and the light duty um, vehicle stations that can unlock a, a, a network that can be used by taxis, which tend to, to operate in, in the cities, of course, um, as long as the more long distance mobility um, driven by AFIA, the Alternative Fuel Infrastructure Regulation, that, that will put hydrogen stations um, on the, the major roads of Europe. The FC, FCEVs themselves, of course, um, are still relatively costly relative to the incumbent vehicles, uh, petrol, diesel, and of course, relative to the battery electric alternative, although they bring um, yeah, numerous um, operational advantages relative to battery vehicles that, that are um, sufficient to justify their choice by, by some fleets. Um, but we'd expect further reductions in, in future vehicle generations as all of the different components, the fuel cells, the tanks, the power electronics, and so on, as, as they come down in price um, with, with volume. And alongside um, the passenger cars, uh, we're also now seeing, of course, um, light commercial vehicles, um, notably from the French manufacturers, from Renault and Stellantis, um, entering the market, which will uh, address the light commercial vehicles for, for uh, deliveries and, and for, for tradespeople, um, but also would enable um, conversions for seven seat uh, taxi operation where, where many cities require those for wheelchair accessibility um, and to address parts of the taxi market that have not been addressable with the four or five seat um, saloon cars so, uh, so far. And then finally on, on public support, um, Clearly, this project has benefited hugely from the funding from, from the Clean Hydrogen Partnership or the FCH 2JU as it, as it was, um, but have also benefited from local and national support, either um, capital support or um, uh, taxi or, or um, passenger car friendly policies, such as congestion charging and, and um, costs to, to operate petrol and diesel cars inside um, cities. And those uh, those soft measures are likely to be needed for the, the the medium to long term to make sure that the field is is the playing field is level and that the um, zero emissions nature the noise reduction and and the, the pollution benefits 
of these vehicles are correctly recognized um, in, in, the, in the policy support because it, it, it factors in the, the social benefits in terms of hospitalizations and, and air quality um, uh, related disease. Um, so, and these things like um, you know, preferential parking, use of bus lanes, you know, free, free access to congestion charging zones are likely to be a, a key part of the decision process of fleet operators and relatively cheap to provide by cities and governments um, compared with, with very high um, capital cost subsidies. I hope that's given you a, a good overview of, of the two projects. Um, I think we're, we're taking questions at the end as, as part of the panel session, um, but happy if there are any clarification questions now that, that people want to ask and, and otherwise we can continue the discussion in, in, the, in the panel later on. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you to you, Alex. Uh, indeed, we will take questions uh, at the end, so please remain with us. But yeah, first of all, thank you for your explanation. I think we can benefit from the fact that these two projects uh, are closer to, to a conclusion, both of them. So you have shown us uh, a good amount of, of conclusions from the studies that you've done from the survey. Um, but as overall outlook, vehicles performance has been confirmed satisfactory. We still have issues with uh, HRS that are less reliable uh, than the vehicles have been also impacted by pandemic energy prices and supply chain issues. Uh, but we see that uh, the business is adapting to other type of um, other type of, of operations such as the one going toward larger capacity HRS. So we'll see how this will develop in the future. Thank you very much. Then we Thank will come down into the second project and the second presentation. Uh, that would be presented by Constantin Tricot, who is a consultant at uh, ERM. Uh, now we go into the world of trucks and we see how whether there is some common aspect between uh, the business of cars that Alex showed and the one of trucks. The project that he will present is H2 Hall that will deploy 16 trucks and six HRSs in four European countries. Constantin, thank you. I leave the floor to you. Yes, thank you very much, Luca, and uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Constantin Tricot. I'm a consultant at ERM, as uh, Luca uh, just explained. Just uh, maybe a quick note to, uh, to precise that uh, ERM, well, Element Energy used to be the coordinator in this project, uh, but has since been acquired by ERM, who has uh, carried on the, the role. Um, I will now move on to the next slide. I hope you can see me uh, well. Um, but so as a quick uh, project uh, overview, H2O started in February 2019 and is, is due to last until December 2025. Uh, so we are currently at about 60% uh, uh, stage of implementation. And uh, so the total budget, uh, budget for the project is a little over 28 million euros with a maximum contribution from the Clean Hydrogen Partnership of 12 million euros. So now going into the specifics of the project, as uh, Luca mentioned, the overall objective is to develop and uh, deploy and operate uh, 16 heavy duty fuel cell trucks in four European countries, uh, which you can see on the map here. Uh, so four of the trucks are going to be developed by VDL uh, with the fuel cells supplied by Plasticomium, and the trucks will be operated by Colroyd Group in Belgium. The 12 other trucks are developed and uh, deployed by Iveco in Germany, Switzerland, and uh, Air Liquide with fuel cells supplied by Bosch. Um, and of course, with the trucks, uh, as uh, Luca also mentioned, there will be the associated uh, refueling infrastructure uh, with five stations deployed by Coroit, as mentioned, Total Energy, H2 Energy in Switzerland, and Air Liquide in France. Uh, once the trucks are deployed, they will be operated in real-life commercial operation uh, by end users at uh, each of the different sites, uh, with an objective to operate the trucks for a minimum of 2 million kilometers, uh, with the goal of uh, collecting um, 
a great quantity of uh, operational data to uh, monitor the performance of the trucks and uh, evidence their um, their performance in terms of availability, efficiency, and of course the environmental benefits uh, they provide. And uh, so the overarching objective of the whole project for the European Commission is to uh, develop the business case and uh, prepare, pave the way for the uh, wider rollout of uh, fuel cell electric trucks uh, in Europe. Um, so this slide is uh, repeats slightly the information from the previous slide, but it's uh, it is quite efficient to show the structure of the project. Uh, so as we will see in the next slides, we are currently at about uh, the end of the second uh, stage here. So the truck specification and construction and HRS site preparation are uh, at their finalized uh, fin finalizing stage. Uh, and we will be shortly moving to the truck deployment and operation phase, uh, which will run uh, for two years uh, with the associated uh, data collection and monitoring and uh, the, the results that will be evaluated, disseminated and exploited uh, to make sure that the learnings and best practices uh, are used uh, adequately to inform and influence the future developments of the technology. So now going into a bit more details in the, the achievements of the project so far, and uh, starting with the truck development aspect. Uh, as you can see on the chrono, well, the arrow here, we are at about 80% uh, of uh, the objective to deploy and operate uh, the 16 H2O trucks. Uh, so this means that, as I mentioned before, the, the whole pre-deployment phase of uh, designing the trucks, uh, Detailing the the technical specifications and designs have been uh, have been now completed. Uh, the prototypes of the fuel cells have been integrated into the trucks, uh, which have an, uh, undergone a battery of uh, tests, and we are now at uh, the stage of uh, finalizing the truck construction, the testing, and uh, starting the homologation activities for both uh, for both uh, Iveco and VDL trucks. And uh, so we will be looking at the start of operation with the uh, deliveries to the different end users early in 2024. And uh, just to mention some of the some uh, of the main milestones we already we already reached uh, in the truck development side of uh, the project. Um, so the Iveco Ulm assembly line was uh, officially inaugurated last year. Uh, so this assembly line will uh, build uh, their wider series uh, fuel cell electric trucks. Um, and all, both uh, the Iveco and VDL trucks have also been uh, already presented at the IAA in Munich. Uh, so for the Iveco trucks, that was in 2022 and in 2023, so a few weeks ago for VDL. Now looking at the hydrogen refueling infrastructure aspect, uh, we are at a similar stage of uh, progress of about uh, 75% uh, with the objective of having uh, the five uh, HRS deployed and operated within H2O. Um, so worth noting that the three HRSs that are actually funded in the project uh, are now already operational. Uh, the HRS in Switzerland operated by H2 Energy uh, has been uh, operating since 2021 with a very satisfying uh, availability rate. And the two HRSs in France and in Belgium have been deployed uh, in 2023. Um, and then we will be looking for a deployment of the of the total energy, sorry, the total energy stations uh, in 2024. Now that we have a, a general overview of the project's uh, status uh, at this point, uh, on this slide I will be presenting some of the main risks, challenges and lessons learned from the project so far. Um, so starting uh, starting with some of the, the main challenges we encountered and were able to, to overcome. Uh, it, they relate to uh, the alignment of technical specifications between uh, the trucks and uh, the HRS infrastructure, for example, uh, with uh, different refueling pressures uh, being implemented at different sites, uh, so uh, either 350 bar or 700 bar. 
so this has required a very um, well continuous communication between the OEMs and the HRS providers to make sure that the refueling protocols were aligned. Um, truck truck uh, manufacturers also had to uh, to have uh, uh, sustained uh, discussions with uh, their customers to define uh, the routes and mission profiles for the trucks and make sure that uh, the truck uh, performance and specifications were adapted to to these uh, to these users. And uh, finally, some customer requirements had to be considered uh, with. For example, specific trailers needing to be ordered in Germany uh, due to, to specific uh, country regulation for heavy duty mobility. Uh, but all these challenges uh, have been uh, have been resolved now, uh, so they are great uh, great learnings from, from the project. Uh, among other lessons learned, uh, we have uh, found that uh, collaboration with other industry projects is uh, is key, and uh, and enables to to really leverage and uh, optimize the lessons learned of the different projects, and also to avoid uh, mistakes being repeated. Uh, so we maintain uh, uh, continuous collaboration and communication with projects such as Pride, Immortal, Stash or a project from the Eveto cluster that you can see at the bottom of the slide here. Uh, and uh, these projects uh, are very are key uh, to tackle different issues linked to the fuel, heavy duty fuel cell uh, technology, uh, such as uh, the refueling protocol alignment, the durability and lifetime of the stacks, or uh, the um, standardization of fuel cell modules. Uh, another lesson uh, that was uh, quite key at the beginning of the project was uh, understanding the diverging uh, country specific processing, uh, uh, sorry, permitting uh, requirements. Uh, so in different countries, uh, the regulations vary, and uh, this is something that uh, needs to be taken into account at the planning phase of HRS deployment to avoid uh, significant delays. Um, still on, uh, HRS, uh, on the HRS side, it is uh, also key, as uh, we saw from Alex's presentation on Zephyr and H2ME, uh, that uh, the hydrogen refueling uh, uh, infrastructure availability is absolutely uh, crucial to uh, stable operation of the vehicles. And uh, to do so, uh, what well, to enable that, it is uh, important to build in uh, adequate uh, redundancy at the stations. And so this can imply uh, having um, sufficient uh, stocks of spare parts there directly at the station, for example. Uh, and finally, um, as we can see in uh, many of these uh, hydrogen technology projects, uh, having a high level of utilization is key to, uh, to, to guarantee a sustainable, a viable business case for the infrastructure. And now just to conclude on this presentation, a uh, quick look at uh, the communication and dissemination activities and their organization within the project. Um, so Hydrogen Europe, uh, which is also part of the Clean Hydrogen Partnership, is uh, the communication lead uh, in the project and is being supported by the IRU, the International Road Transport Union, uh, which gives a good uh, perspective to the wider heavy duty haulage industry. Uh, Waterstoffnet, uh, who is in charge of organizing the observer group uh, to share the results and learnings of the project uh, with uh, the wider industry as well. And ERM as coordinate, coordinating partner is uh, supporting also the communication activities. And uh, so all communication activities are leveraged through our uh, online presence. Uh, so on the dedicated project website and on the social media accounts. And finally, partners are uh, very regularly throughout the life of the project uh, represent, representing H2O at uh, various events uh, they participate in. Um, so that's it from me. I hope uh, this gives a clear overview of uh, the H2O project, its objectives, and uh, its status, and the main uh, learning so far. Um, as, uh, as mentioned, I will be happy to, to take uh, questions, uh, but I think that's at the end of the session. Okay, thank you very much, Constantin. Um, indeed, question will come at the end of the session. Just for me, just one quick note that I've seen uh, as a common aspect between 
H2M2 uh, and Zephyr is once again the fact that the, the high utilization of HRSs is, is a, a key component uh, for the HRS themselves, but in specific for the heavy duty business case, and also the fact that uh, there's a need for redundancy between uh, within the same HRSs. So to make sure that uh, if there is a component breakdown, there is anyway the possibility to use the HRS. Uh, through another, for example, a nozzle. Okay, thank you very much. I think we conclude here with um, H2O, but we remain in the field of uh, trucks with the third project that we'll be presenting, which is uh, H2 Accelerate Trucks, uh, part of the H2 Accelerate Initiative by uh, Stefan Molochos, who will present, who is the Vice President of Marketing Hydrogen Technologies at Sintef. And this project uh, will deploy 150 trucks along five 10 corridors in eight member states in Europe. I leave the floor to you, Stefan. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your kind introduction, Luca. Um, I'll present on the H2 Accelerate Trucks uh, project, as Luca mentioned. This is a large scale deployment project, and uh, I'll go into some more details in a minute. So on the first slide you'll see, uh, or the second slide, you can see that this was a project uh, coming out from the uh, call 2022 on large scale demonstration of European heavy duty uh, uh, trucks uh, based, uh, powered by hydrogen along the 10T corridors. We started the project pretty recently. We uh, started it in, in February, uh, so we are uh, roughly 10 months uh, down the road. We have a, a significant budget, as you can see here, a su support from uh, the Commission, uh, around 30 million euros, and a total budget uh, of more than 100 million euros. And there is so some minor co-funding from the Research Council of Norway and also the State Secretary for Education, Research and Innovation in Switzerland. The uh, partners are well distributed. This is a truly a pan-European pan effort. Uh, participants for uh, and partners from nine nine member states, as you can see here. And again, the uh, ambition and, and plan is to deploy the trucks along the Tenti corridors illustrated to the right. It should be mentioned that uh, the uh, refueling stations and funding to those are not part of this project. So. The H2 Accelerate Trucks is focusing on developing the trucks and, and preparing them for eventual uh, lead, uh, fleet launch. Uh, but the uh, refueling stations needed to, to deploy the trucks will be uh, funded through and will uh, has already has been partly funded through other projects. I'll come back to that. There, there is the overall goal of the project shown uh, here. Uh, to support the transition of fuel cell trucks from technically really proven but high cost demonstrators to viable commercial commercial choice a viable commercial choice for the operators across Europe and you can see also at the bottom here the four main objectives uh, deploying in this case 150 uh, fuel cell power trucks more than 40 tons gross weight in nine countries, and uh, they will be uh, operated uh, uh, or refueled through the uh, uh, HRS network, especially designed for these heavy duty uh, trucks, meaning that they have a high capacity, one to two tons per day. We are putting significant effort into uh, analysis of not only technical, but also environmental, economic, as well as, well as attitudinal data. And in that respect, it's we would um, highly appreciate to to share some or to to, to adapt adopt some lessons learned from the H2 whole project. Of course, that would be key, so we don't repeat uh, mistakes and 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 uh, are prepared for the the challenges that we might uh, uh, see uh, in our project. And of course, the last and very important uh, objective to the right uh, to raise the awareness of of the benefits of using hydrogen and green hydrogen for trucking in Europe to, to make sure that we, we, we uh, reach the decarbonization and we, we are then heavily into to communicating this message. 
the uh, next slide is showing uh, <clears throat> where we are. Uh, we are uh, all together in, in the project. We have three uh, leading uh, truck manufacturers uh, who are all in the forefront of development uh, through self-powered heavy duty trucks. And they will, during and as part of the project, further develop the technologies beyond state of the art in terms of performance, reliability and cost. And they, the project itself would contribute to scaling up their uh, manufacturer uh, ability capabilities uh, to then towards 2030 be able to produce much higher volumes of trucks. And uh, the uh, HRS providers shown with the logos, Shell, Total Energies and Everfuel, they are uh, would contribute to increase the supply of green hydrogen. And, and again, along the uh, comments of, of Luca and, and, and Constantin, uh, we will, of course, uh, try to, in this case, uh, make sure that we could have uh, some lessons learned uh, and utilized in our project, not least making sure that we have a high reliability and availability of the fuel uh, so that the user experience is, is, is maximized in that respect. To take H2 whole one step further towards uh, a complete and, and well functioning. Uh, value chain. So we have uh, we're starting with pre-commercial products. Uh, we are working along a lot of uh, activities uh, as we are in the start of the project. We estimate around 10-20% uh, uh, execution. Uh, we have a six-year project. Uh, we are working on adaptation and 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 pre uh, preparations of the manufacturing uh, faci facilities and uh, all three. Uh, uh, truck manufacturers uh, uh, facilities. We are preparing for homologation and type approval for the first uh, Iveco trucks, which will be um, the, the supplier to developing or deploying these trucks first of the three. Initial, uh, we are having a uh, substantial dialogue with the end users. So we, we have uh, an HRS network operators included in the, in the uh, discussion and in the consortium. So have a close also dialogue there. We are preparing the maintenance uh, facilities, uh, training personnel. We have uh, already developed and agreed on the protocols for data monitoring and analysis. And we have established this dissemination and exploitation plan so far. We also have a, in, in the pipeline very soon uh, a safety plan to be uh, agreed upon and, and, and submitted. When it comes to the market readiness, uh, we have several products, uh, sorry, <laughs> prototypes, which has already been uh, demonstrated from all of the three uh, truck manufacturers. Uh, these are uh, have been tested in-house as well as on public roads. And uh, the, uh, the focus for those testing uh, uh, activities are, uh, of course, uh, operation under demanding climate conditions uh, and also uh, demonstrating the long range, which is one of the uh, key performance indicators of this uh, H2 Accelerate Trucks project, that every truck should at least be able to, to, to uh, drive more than 600 kilometers. And we have, uh, we can uh, appreciate and, and acknowledge Daimler's recent achievement that they, uh, they have not achieved a range of more than 1,000 kilometers with their, their recent uh, demonstration of a liquid hydrogen powered heavy duty truck with a total weight of, of more than 40 tons. So with this uh, slide on the screen, I would like to share a, a short video of the testing of uh, the hydrogen uh, trucks by Volvo uh, in the northern part of Sweden.
thank you. Um, as part of a, a newly started project, it's also, also about building the team to, to eventually succeed in this pretty, uh, let's say, uh, large uh, effort to contribute to the decarbonisation of heavy duty transport in, in Europe. So I'm happy to, to show a couple of pictures from the kickoff meeting in Brussels and not least also from the last, uh, last project meeting, the consortium meeting in Gothenburg at, at Volvo's premises. And uh, that leads me to the dissemination activities. We have already uh, uh, launched a press release and one white paper on the uh, expectations for the first phase of the fuel cell truck and infrastructure deployment. We have, uh, uh, we are preparing for dedicated end user meetings uh, to encourage new operators to, uh, to adopt uh, these uh, kind of vehicles. Uh, the dissemination plan also includes uh, uh, activities towards uh, sharing lessons learned, uh, lessons learned, and and of course best practice guide is something that would be developed in this uh, during the project. We will contribute by presentations uh, uh, and exhibitions. Um, exhibits uh, one example would be uh, would be the uh, uh, Iveco will show one of the heavy duty trucks uh, during the uh, uh, hydrogen week next week that will be part of H2 Hall. But anyway, it's an important uh, uh, outreach and dissemination activity. And uh, we have specific uh, dedicated outreach activities towards Eastern Europe. Uh, the LinkedIn account is, is already online and we have a, an up, now a web page also for the project as such. And there are significant synergies, uh, which I indicated earlier in my, my, my uh, intervention. Uh, we have all together through the CEF funding scheme, the uh, uh, connecting European facility. We have uh, uh, in our, our partners have succeeded in, in, in bids and in total 41 uh, hydrogen refueling stations with a capacity of one more than one ton and some two tons and, and and more per day uh, will then uh, safeguard the, the availability of fuel, and which is of course a prerequisite for uh, the su successful launch of the 150 trucks. So and again, the, uh, the the main challenge for this kind of, of larger deployment project is always the synchronization of deployment uh, of the trucks versus the availability of fuel. And that is really the key now to, to make sure that the, the, uh, we, we, we put uh, on the table viable business cases for the entire uh, value chain and each stakeholder along that value chain. So by that, I thank you so much for your attention. Thank you to you, Stefan, uh, for the explanation and for the presentation. We look forward to see the trucks in operation on the roads for, for the next years, you already shown that the prototypes are being tested, which looks very, very promising. Uh, but I would say that throughout the next year, we will we are curious to see the development of the business case for these companies jointly with the development of the HRSs from um, X to Accelerate. But thank you very much once again. I would say now we go, uh, we leave the, the world of uh, road transport. So we leave the road for a second. We go into, into the air with the project uh, Heaven. That will be presented by Maria Solrao, who is a project manager of the Heaven project at H2Fly. Um, Maria, I'll leave the floor to you and I would uh, let you show the achievements of these projects that I know are very interesting. Please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I have to go over the challenge of sharing properly the image. Um, please tell me if you are seeing the correct image. Uh, okay. I think Let's start. Now, yes. Yeah, now, yes. No. Okay. Perfect. Uh, yes. My name is Maria. I am a project coordinator of Heaven. This uh, project uh, was proposed on the call year 2018, and it was uh, proposed for the call topic um, with the name fuel cell system for the propulsion of aerial um, passenger vehicle. 
uh, after approval, it started to Im be implemented during January 2019, and we have uh, finished with the complete implementation of the project uh, last September. So the uh, end of September, we completed the project. The total budget of the project was around uh, 7 million and we got from the clean hydrogen partnership around 4 million euros. The partners inside this uh, project um, were Elikid, DLR, Fundación Ayesa, Pipistrel and IKPO and also H of Fly. Um, to to work inside this project, the, the, the main objective of this project was just to address or addressing the gap in between um, the, the research and the product stage um, of zero emission fuel cell based propulsion technology in aviation. To achieve this work, all the consortium was working very hard and they we, we have distributed and structured our work in different work packages that included activities in the area of the system architecture. Also on the field cell development, we work also very hard on the, the design and development of uh, the proper uh, hydrogen fuel system. Then we have also to couple all the parts inside the aircraft. So we work on the system coupling activities and uh, we integrate um, all the parts also inside the aircraft. Finally, when everything was completed, we uh, went over the flight demonstration. All these activities were also communicated, disseminated and exploited as the commission is expecting. And HFLY was uh, the project manager and the coordinator of the project. Um, yeah, with, with the project, what, what we have achieved and what we have shown uh, worldwide is that it's possible to fly with a liquid hydrogen. We have uh, implemented uh, in September and we have tested um, that it's uh, with the first LA2 flight that we can fly with LA2 and that this uh, technology is having a lot of promising uh, potential. Um, we, we proved that uh, the LH technology is allowed to reduce uh, the, the, the um, weight of the tank that you need in the airplane and also you reduce the volume, the volume and with that you can uh, double the, um, the maximum range of, of, of flying. Main uh, application and market area are transportation, hydrogen fuel cells, and EV tolls. Um, to to see how was the, the progress, well, we started in 2011, uh, in 2011, in 2019, and we have uh, several milestones that went till September 2023. The first milestone was in the middle of 2020 where we have uh, achieved the conceptual design of the powertrain, the hydrogen fuel system and the ground support equi um, equipment, uh, also from the conceptual design of the drivetrain. Then in March 2022, we have uh, achieved the manufacture of the cryogenic system and uh, the development of the ground support equipment. Then coming to the second half of the 2022, we have tested and verified that the cryogenic system was um, functional and was good to, to be implemented in the aircraft. Then uh, later on 2022, we have integrated uh, everything on the, um, on the aircraft. On the beginning of this year, in March 2023, we have completed the coupling activities. So we coupled the fuel cell system with the hydrogen fuel system and the battery system of the aircraft. And when we were completed with that, we just move all the aircraft and all the team to the final um, place where we have tested and, and flight. This was in Maribor in Slovenia. Where there we have done the, uh, all the functionality test of the ground uh, in the ground first and then we were able to fly it. Within all these activities, what we have achieved uh, was at the end of the project also some uh, 
main KPIs that, that we can mention here is the fuel cell stack was having at the end of the project 2.55 kilowatt per kilogram. The air system uh, was having an efficiency over 60%. The power converter was uh, having 8 kilogram per uh, a kilowatt per kilogram. And the hydrogen system was having a gravimetric index of 11.5 and the system lifetime at stack level was from around 5,000 hours. Then uh, let's we move to more specific technical issues. Going to the hydrogen fuel system. This hydrogen fuel system, when we started the project, it was at a lower tier air. We were at the lab um, tier air and uh, with a lower also gravimetric index. And at the end of the project, we have demonstrated that this, it was possible to be implemented. And Started we have, um, yes? Yeah, I think we see the screen in uh, not in presentation mode, but in- uh, I don't know what... mode. Okay, now it's good. Now it's good. I, I don't know. I didn't, okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Now it's fine. Uh, okay. Um, uh, yes, at the, at the end of the project, we were uh, checking that it was possible to implement this technology on the aviation area. Uh, and the system was basically um, composed by a cryogenic system, a hydrogen um, buffer tank, um, a ground support equipment, a control command module, a hydrogen uh, heating system also, and also the safety system. Um, some key performances of this uh, wonderful tank is that we were able to supply hydrogen at 6.3 bar. Uh, we have a store capacity of 15 kilogram in a system that was uh, having 140 kilograms. Um, the tank uh, can feed up up to uh, 100 kilowatt fuel cell and the dormancy of the time of the tank was in between 10 and 15 hours. Once the tank was, as I, I mentioned previously, tested and verified, we have come out to the um, integration actions for doing that. We have first to modify the aircraft, uh, the left fuselage, we have to modify it. There was place to two people sitting and we have to modify it to fit it the, the tank. Um, so there were some airframe mo modification. Then we have to test that the structure was uh, stable enough to fly. And then we have done the final fittings. When the integration was finished by Pipistrel, uh, HFly team came to um, Sassenage to allocate facilities where we have implemented all the coupling actions. So we have coupled the fuel cell system with the, um, the hydrogen um fuel system and the battery system and everything was done in between i think that it was january and march uh, and march and uh, so we have to prepare the facility for making this kind of uh, activities in the picture you are seeing the the real place where it was uh, coupled and, and and tested at the end so we have to check all the possible problems of this uh, coupling, coupling action. So everything, all the functionalities should have been checked. And at the end, we have um, proved that uh, the system was uh, properly coupled and that we were able to start with our uh, ground and um, flying test campaign. So for doing that, we have to move everything, all the team and all the aircraft to Maribor. There is where we have done our final flying um, testing campaign. And um, I think that now is coming uh, the, the video of the flight test. Uh, please, can you share it? As an engineer, you have a feeling that it's not only technology. It is drive to change the future. We're super excited because today we prepare for the world's first flight with a liquid hydrogen powered electric aircraft. And hopefully we're going to write history. 
from a technical point of view, we and the team are ready. So now it's all on the hands of the weather, then we can go. Telemetry, are we clear to go? Uh, one ready, clear for takeoff. 120, 130, 138, 140, climb. climb. Now let's prepare for landing. 103, 100, 99, touch down. So the flight today was very successful. We have seen that it is possible to fly with liquid hydrogen. And today we see that the technology works perfectly together. So we can envision bigger aircraft with more passengers going long range. So... With this, when you see the video, you think, yeah, everything was roses and everything was uh, running smoothly. Well, um, no, we have some, faced some risks, some challenges, and we have learned a lot on that. The, at the end, we have a, a great achievement and we are all very proud of what we have done. But during the period of this project, we have faced as main risk that I can mention, technologies that were not performing as we were expecting. We were also uh, having the risk of material acquisition problem, delay on, in manufacturing, integration problems or problems also during the, the coupling phase. There were coming continuously problems and um, and we have faced all, all of these uh, risks. Challenges, pandemic. Pandemic was was a year that we were all like not knowing how to proceed with, with what we wanted to do and what we had to do under these conditions. Certification was also very challenging. Um, we were running out of time and we had to move uh, very fast and there were many things, a lot of documentation and bureaucracy. Uh, it's taking a lot of time. Time coordination of the coupling integration and the flight test demonstration. We were different companies working all together working outside of our places uh, so we have to always coordinate a lot of movement of people of hardware uh, everything should be very had to be very good coordinated and with this was very challenging and also we had to face big modifications inside our consortium and this was also a huge challenge for for all the team lessons learned we had learned that we need to very openly talk about what we were seeing that was coming. We were seeing some risk problems and we were just talking in between us just to face that. Um, we have to learn that this is what we have and we have to do the best with what we have. We have welcomed a lot of changes during this uh, journey and we have learned also to respect a lot our colleagues, our different teams and also our work. Then finally, coming to the exploitation strategy, something to mention about that. Well, um, this is the beginning of uh, clean aviation, sustainable aviation. Let's we said inside the project, what we have done related to exploitation was going according to the main things in the commission is to identify first the backgrounds, projects, results, and exploitable results make clarifications on IP issues and analyze, uh, analyze our market and also take into consideration that we are different uh, companies with different individual exploitation plan. At the end of the project, we have identified more than 20 uh, exploitable results. So the, 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 the outcomes are really so many and we have so many potentials. And um, just to mention, we have two main um, yeah, implementation markets that are the hydrogen fuel cells and EV tolls impact. Well, we have increased uh, and proved that it's possible to increase the autonomy of a small battery based electric area vehicle um, for at least two factor. We have proved that uh, we can uh, safely 
uh, flight. We have demonstrated that also it's uh, uh, economic viable, and we have also demonstrated that we can have a major um, positive uh, environmental impact. These are some things to mention about the impact of this project. Um, we are very, very, very happy with, with all what we have achieved. And in case that you want to learn more or to talk about the project, they, these are my contact details. And if not, we are also going to be next week in the Hydrogen Week. Thanks. Thank you very much, Maria, and uh, great work. Congratulations also from our side. Uh, obviously, we are we acknowledge that this type of operation, this type of engineering, uh, must come with the challenges for uh, such a, such a project that is on a field as the hydrogen powered aviation that is still not yet mature. And obviously, uh, you had to face several challenges such as authorization, infrastructure, um, et cetera, et cetera, that you highlighted. But eventually, it was good to see the aircraft flying. Thank you very much. Um, we have still two presentations from um, uh, H2 port, so uh, uh, for the port of Valencia and uh, FCH to rail. We have 30 minutes. I think if we both of you manage to stay within the 12 minutes, we would have sufficient time for some Q&A at the end. So uh, I give the word to uh, Aurelio Lazaro, who is uh, R&D engineer at uh, Fundacion Valencia port. Later, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction, Luca. Um, I'm going to talk about the H2 Ports uh, project that uh, is going to be the first operational experience of using uh, green hydrogen in uh, real port operations. The project uh, uh, is uh, financed but by a Call that was released back in 2018. The project started in 2019 and has been extended until the end of 2024. It's uh, quite a long project uh, in which uh, we are going to, we have developed uh, two uh, port handling machines that uh, are currently being tested in the, in the port of, of Valencia. The total uh, budget of the project is over 4 million euros. The current state of implementation is very high. We are currently in the last uh, stage of the project that is the piloting of these machines in the port. And you can see there the contribution uh, of uh, the clean iron and partnership according to the full uh, rules. Uh, this is the port of Valencia where the project is being developed. Uh, the Port of Valencia is the fourth busiest port in Europe and the busiest, the first one in the Mediterranean area. And in this very challenging scenario is where these two completely new uh, machines are going to be uh, tested and challenged to see if they are currently able to replace the current diesel-based uh, uh, machinery that is being used in this uh, in these uh, terminals this has been really in the the major challenge of of the project to uh, develop new machines and uh, having the same standards of uh, uh, of performance as a technology that has been uh, used uh, during so many years as the current uh, um, uh, equivalent um in the port uh we are going to to test uh, uh two two uh, container handling machines one of them is a rich stacker this is the one that you can see on the left hand side um and it's going to be tested at the mcc terminal in in here in valencia is a container terminal and this machine essentially what it does is to uh, do uh, small movements with the containers uh, such as uh, moving them within the terminal, uh, loading them into a train. Uh, the other machine is a yard uh, tractor uh, that uh, essentially is the is a machine that is able to move the platforms of the trucks that arrive uh, to the port and onboard them on the on the vessels. 
Uh, due to storage loss, these machines cannot abandon the terminals at any point, so we needed to develop a, a concept of HRS, a hydrogen repelling system, uh, a mobile one, that uh, is uh, the one that goes to the terminals every morning and do the refueling process uh, in both terminals and later gets back to the, to the basement. Um, is the, the the partnership that is currently uh, uh, performing the project is coordinated by us from the Film Valencia Board and has the uh, complete support of uh, the public authorities such as the the Port Authority of Valencia. We have two research institutions on board, uh, such as uh, the Spanish National Hydrogen Center and Athena, that is a spin-off uh, related with uh, uh, Enea, the Italian. National Research Center and the University of Naples. Uh, we have different members coming from the from the industry, uh, such as uh, Carburos Metallicos, that is the Spanish brand of fair products, that is our hydrogen provider. We have a uh, Heister Jail, that is a um, machine, port machinery uh, manufacturer based in the Netherlands. Uh, we have uh, Ballard as uh, the fuel cell uh, manufacturer that is producing one of the fuses that is used in the in the yard tractor. Uh, this Canadian company that is also based in Denmark, and we have also Enagas that is the national uh, natural gas TSO here in Spain uh, that is bringing the experience in uh, providing uh, industrial gases to uh, port environments. And last but not least, we have also the end users that at the end is the most important piece in this puzzle as they are going to be the ones that test the machines and if they agree, they will incorporate them to the to the to their daily operations that are the MCC terminal in Valencia and the Valte terminal uh, that belongs to uh, Grimaldi Group. Uh, the project started back in 2019. Uh, we have been struggling with um, with uh, the same kind of problems that, that were mentioned also in previous presentations. Uh, and during uh, the first stage of the project that has lasted uh, more than three years, we have been able to uh, build the machines and do the preliminary testing. Back in um, uh, between April and September, these machines are now in, in the port and we are uh, currently finalizing the preliminary test before entering in, in operation in the upcoming uh, weeks or uh, even days. Um, going to the, to the pilots itself, uh, this is the hydrogen supply concept that, as I said, has been developed uh, within the project by the Spanish National Hydrogen Center. Uh, it's a mobile uh, concept, but it has also a fixed part that is composed by a buffer tank that is able to store up to 180 kilos of hydrogen up to a pressure of 40 bars. Our hydrogen supplier uh, brings and uh, discharges the hydrogen into this uh, uh, the uh, vessel uh, and we have also a compressor station that increases the pressure of this hydrogen into the delivery pressure of up to 450 bars. Uh, the HRS is, is able to store at high pressure up to 60 kilos of hydrogen and we will reach a maximum flow rate of 3.6 kilos per minute uh, what uh, allows the uh, rapid uh, refill of the machines and this is the one of the main advantages if we compare it uh, hydrogen technologies with uh, uh, the electric uh, alternatives uh, uh, this technology is able to refill much much faster and this is really a, a, a major uh, advance for the kind of work that is done in a, a port terminal that works 24-7 uh, and they cannot have this uh, spare uh, units, uh, 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 let's say, uh, non-functional uh, due to uh, the recharging of, of these machines. 
This is a picture of the of the HRS. It's uh, located in premises of the Port Authority, in a strategic position between both terminals to to ease the refueling process. Uh, here's some picture of the mobile part uh, already in the in the terminals. Uh, due, uh, doing, doing some of the refueling uh, tests that uh, were performed at the beginning of this uh, last stage. Uh, this is the rate stacker that has been uh, manufactured by our partner Heister Yale. Um, once in operation, uh, uh, we will be able to reduce up to 128 tons of CO2 emissions, that is the current emission levels of the diesel uh, equivalent and also this machine will have improved productivity in comparison with the current uh, uh, diesel based technology that uh, is being used on the on the port it uh, has uh, two uh, fuel cells that are working as a rich standard as rich standard uh, uh, these uh, fuel cells are produced by the manufacturer at Nuvera so the total uh, power of the uh, hydrogen power unit is 90 kilowatts. Um, the consumption of uh, these fossils in a uh, shift of operation will uh, be uh, around uh, 30 kilos of, of, of hydrogen. And um, it can be even extended for a, a second shift in operations if it's, uh, uh, it's uh, optimized its consumption. So this is also uh, a, a major advance because uh, we don't need the very low prices of, of hydrogen to, 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 to obtain an alternative that could be economically competitive also with a thermal equivalent. I uh, have here a video terminal tractor in this case instead of being a completely new design it's a retrofit from a diesel equivalent in which uh, our partner Athena has replaced the thermal uh, power system by an hydrogen uh, power system uh, this hydrogen power system is composed by a fuel cell that has been produced by Ballard and adapted to a terminal uh, tractor uh, requirements you can see there the picture of the of the fuel cell it has a total power of 70 uh, of 70 kilowatts and uh, it has also a battery pack uh, the, in this case instead of being uh, instead of working as a rich standard the fuel cell and the battery pack are also able to work in parallel to provide a very high uh, specific demand of this machine in a in detailed uh, 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 parts of the of the of the cycle when the tractor is getting into the in the vessel it has to go up into a ramp and this is very demanding so at this point of the working cycle the, the the terminal tractor requests a lot of power so in that moment both the fuel cell and the battery pack are working at the same time and in other uh, parts of the cycle the fuel cell are just recharging the, the battery pack so we can say that it works very similarly to a hybrid uh, concept car and in this video we can see the first movements of the 
to the terminal structure in, in operations here at the, at the port of, of Valencia. It was a rainy day, which is not very common. We, uh, we can see the, here how, how it works. Uh, and additionally, within the project, we are also covering other cross cutting aspects, uh, such as logistics. We are also evaluating how uh, uh, hydrogen could be provided to terminals of the port once with, with if this project gets uh, replicated and instead of having one machine in this terminal, we have a higher number of machines. Uh, indeed, the, the logistic system that we are using in the, in the project is, uh, uh, it, it doesn't suffice to, to, to provide hydrogen in a larger scale. So we will envisage those uh, new ways of providing hydrogen, such as maybe internal uh, generation of hydrogen in the, in the terminals or uh, other kind of distribution system within the port using pipelines. We're going to evaluate that from a theoretical point of view. And uh, we have done a, a, a thoughtful uh, regulatory uh, review, uh, evaluating the currently uh, regulatory framework that affects the, the project and also indicating some regulatory developments that need to be done in order to ease uh, the, the further development of, of these technologies in a, in a port environment. And we are also evaluating the possibilities of a market aid uptake and uh, evaluating the conditions in which uh, uh, this technology will be uh, economically competitive with the uh, diesel-based uh, 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 technology that is currently being used in the port. Regarding the dissemination activities, we have been really, really active in this, in this period. Uh, we, uh, we have uh, uh, released uh, more than 18 press releases uh, that uh, has ended up in more than 18 pieces of news. Uh, we have awarded uh, different uh, awards regarding the, the, uh, the project uh, implementation. Um, the media has really covered a lot this 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 all this project. It, it has even been mentioned by the Spanish Prime Minister in some interventions talking about the implementation of hydrogen technologies in, in Spain. Uh, we have also a stakeholder group that has over uh, 80 uh, members uh, right now, and we organize uh, regular meetings with them to discuss the, the status of the project and uh, related topics. Uh, we have uh, different social media accounts in which uh, we publish the, um, all uh, everything concerning the project, and we are going to be very act especially active from from now on, showing the performance of the machines in the port environment. And here you can see some of the uh, most important uh, uh, media coverage that has been done in this project that we have appeared in television. Uh, different times and uh, especially now that we are entering into this piloting uh, stage we are also expecting that uh, the, the coverage of this project will be even further extended uh, next week you know, in a couple of weeks actually the 28th of November we are having the, the demo day in which uh, many different uh, uh, stakeholders coming from the port industry and uh, the logistics sector uh, the energy sector uh, and, and have been invited to to see in operations uh, these machines and well uh, uh, we are also going to have a, a great coverage of, of this event so you will be able to to follow the machines perform in the, in the port. and this would be uh, all from my side thank you very much for your attention Okay, thank you to you, Aurelio. Indeed, very complex project. I believe uh, this is something similar to a sort of small hydrogen ecosystem that you are implementing in the Port of Valencia because you showed us the production, the storage, the end uses, and indeed, very good activities on the dissemination that I believe this project is completely suitable for uh, such dissemination activity. Don't forget to uh, uh, to involve us and as, as well we can do something else in terms of uh, fostering the participation to your event in uh, at the end of November.
Thank you again. We move into the last project presenting, uh, which now goes back to the, to the ground on the rail in particular. This is a FCH to rail. Uh, this project in the last year has completed some tests on public railway in Spain. Uh, but I leave the word to Holger Ditus, who is the project manager at uh, DLR, to speak about it. Holger, we have something like 10 minutes. Um, don't want to, sorry, I have to put a little bit of pressure on you, but uh, I leave the floor to you uh, for the time management. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction, Luca. Um, yes, uh, we are used to delays in railways, uh, especially <laughs> in Germany. So, um, yeah, today I'm presenting the FCH to rail project. Our aim is to develop a fuel cell hybrid power pack, especially for, for railway applications. Um, the project uh, was following the call of 2020 with the topic of extending the use cases for fuel cell trains through innovative designs and streamlined administrative framework. It's an innovation action that lasts four years. We started in 2021, and at the moment we are in plan to end uh, end of next year. Uh, currently, a uh, stage of implementation is like 75%. Uh, we have a contribution from the Clean Hydrogen Partnership of 10 million euro and a total project budget of 13.4 uh, million. The partners are coming from four European uh, states. So we have uh, Portugal, Spain, Belgium, and uh, Germany here. Uh, with Toyota, we have the fuel cell uh, manufacturer, CAF as a, a train manufacturer, uh, Stemmein Technik, part of the Wabtec company, is also from the railway business, a supplier of technologies, Renfe as an operator of trains, uh, infrastructure. Infrastructuras de Portugal and Adif, Administrator de Infrastructuras Ferroviarias, are the infrastructure managers, and the two research centers, DLR and the National Hydrogen Center, are part of the project. Um, the main objectives are to firstly to develop, build, and test this uh, fuel cell hybrid power pack, multi purpose power pack, and uh, the second main objective is to demonstrate it in a bi mode uh, multiple unit which by mode means in that case that this train is able to drive uh, with the pantograph on electricity and where no electrification is available, we can go with the hybrid system instead of a diesel, which was used before. I'll skip the other two uh, events. You can see a little picture of the power pack concept on the bottom of the presentation here, yeah, the slide. Um, the application and market area, uh, as said, it's a railway application. It should be, the power pack should be usable for different applications, which means multiple un units, shunters, and mainline locos. And according to a study from, I think, 2090, there could be a market of up to almost 1,000 vehicles up to uh, 2030 for this kind of uh, powertrain. Compared to the global or international state of the art, um, we have some unique um, selling point, let's say. So this power pack is a multi-purpose power pack suitable for different applications, also for refurbishment, um, and could be used with or without catenary. Um, while the international state of the art is pure hybrid trains not being able to drive under catenary or to use the catenary. Um, our main aim is, or main objective is the TRL7 homologation of the power pack. So we started according to the uh, V model uh, in engineering with the development uh, of the fuel cell power pack, which also includes an extended uh, line analysis in Spain, Portugal, and Germany to develop the use cases. Um, then we started with the implementation and testing um, of one of the two power packs we develop here. In parallel, the other power pack was integrated to the train. And the first static tests and, homo, um, and homologations um, were performed, ending in May 2023 with the first authorization of the train to run on public uh, lines. This also started the demonstration phase, which is one of the other big objectives of the train. So we want to use the power pack or the train and gain experience from the real life service here. And the achievement, which is maybe the biggest one in the whole project, is um, that we have the first hydrogen train on the Spanish railway network, uh, which was driving there um, since June 2023. Um, and now, at the moment, we started on the second line. Uh, last week, Friday, I think, was the first um, approach to the new, new line, Toralba Soria in Spain. Yes. 
Um, all of these different phases of the project, like testing the power pack, the transformation of the train, and um, the demonstrate the first demonstration are documented in videos. And I just made a small compilation. Uh, maybe we can start the video, please. Is it is it already running? I cannot see anything. Yes, it is running. It is running. Okay, so I don't have a clue what to say because I don't see it. <laughs> I expect that the beginning you see the testing of the fuel cell power pack uh, in Puerto Llano at CNH2's facilities. So three of the six fuel cells, the energy storage system and the energy management have been tested and optimized there. In parallel, we started with the transformation of the train. Um, so this is real heavy metal as you can hopefully see at this moment. Um, um, the fuel cells have been integrated to the roof of the train. Um, the energy storage has been integrated inside the train. Um, yeah, I'm, I have no clue what you see. Sorry. Yeah, no, I can. I found it <laughs> here. Yeah, and um, after integrating everything to the train, we started the first tests of the train and the first demonstration in the Pyrenees, which is a really de demanding railway line that goes uh, yeah high into the mountains. And the first tests ended then in, or the first demonstration ended then in the Canfranc station. Uh, the last picture on the video was this one, where um, yeah, which is quite a nice scenery, and we proved that this technology is able to go on the electric line, also uh, like in the hybrid mode, up to the Pyrenees. So, but uh, with all these good news, there are also some challenges and risks. In our case, I think we we really had uh, challenges concerning the refueling. It was maybe underestimated from the beginning of the project. Um, there were some difficulties or to identify the standards and regulations in railway environment. So we are, it's not so easy to transfer from automotive to railways here. And um, there was also a lack of a commercial solution to refuel large quantities of hydrogen in a short time. Um, and also then we decided to develop our own HRS prototype to be used in the project. Um, during this development, there were also some supply chain issues and so on, like all the others also um, reported. But at the moment, um, or until now, we used provisional dispenser solutions to refuel the train. And now with the new line that is operated since last Friday, um, also parts of the own development are now used uh, for the demonstration of the train. Exploitation, plan and expected impact. Um, well, there are lots of, let's say, internal works of the different partners. So we established processes for the homologation and authorization of these H2 trains in Spanish and Portuguese railways. The technical concepts are evaluated, uh, validated um, and um, brought back to the product development of the different partners on tray level, on fuel cell level. Um, the real life experience will be helpful to support decision making for the introduction of trains in the railway network. And in parallel, we participated in national international standardization activities. Um, for example, we also provided a gap analysis that shows which um, gaps we see in the hydrogen and railway normative frameworks. Also, we published uh, several results already in journals and conferences on our project webpage, YouTube, LinkedIn, and um, for example, also data sets of the line analysis and driving profiles. The impact of this is so far, um, we could prove the technical feasibility and approvability of H2 trains in the Spanish railway network. This bi-mode train operation enables new services, uh, which are currently not provided by conventional diesel trains or pure fuel cell hybrid trains. And um, I think we, we really enhance the visibility of this new technology in the railway and hydrogen communities in Spain and to the, also to the general public. Last but not least, uh, some horizontal activities, corporations have been started. So on the one hand, we have an advisory board consisting of hydrogen and uh, railway stakeholders that support us also in the requirements definition. On the other hand, we established links to the Europe's Rail joint undertaking. We are taking part in the hydrogen standardization booster project or cooperate with them and also 
take the opportunity to use inputs or deliver our outputs to several projects of the Clean Hydrogen Partnership. So just on time, this is it. Thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you very much, Holger. We could see the video. Anyway, it was clear the heavy metal work that had to be done to uh, retrofit the train with the fuel cell uh, and also how impactful this project is in terms of reaching the public because you were showing the video in the video you were showing that the train was passing through public stations so i believe there is no better advertisement than that and thank you very much good so we uh, we reached the conclusion of the um, of the presentations but uh, if you can stay five minutes more because there are two questions from the from the audience that i would like to to answer i would like you to answer um I believe the first one is, yes, for H2 Accelerate, uh, it's a very specific question related to the fact, related to Poland country uh, and how Poland, whether Poland or Poland entities could be part of this project in some way, uh, because apparently there is the same concept to deploy heavy duty vehicles through uh, roads in these two corridors. So Stefan, do you have an answer for that? Do you see any possibility of deployment of these trucks in Poland? There are two, two uh, aspects to, the, to my answer. One is that we have already established some contacts to uh, Polish end users. Uh, so there you will be, uh, at least one of the OEMs have had some, uh, uh, some initial dialogue with end users in Poland. So that's positive. And I think also the uh, uh, the activities uh, uh, in the project uh, carried out or taken care of by UNTRR in Romania would um, try to uh, contribute to the visibility of of this kind of deployment activity in in all the let's say previous and current Eastern European countries. So the the, the short question, the short answer is yes. Okay, very good. Then the participant would be. We'd be glad to hear. And then I believe there was also a second question. Uh, this is for uh, H2ME2 and Zephyr. Whether could you please tell us more about the challenges and successes of this project and what learnings can be shared with the heavy duty sector? So going from uh, whether you believe there is some some lesson learned that can be transferred from the um, uh, yeah, from the light duty sector, that is the area of HTME2 and Zephyr, to the heavy duty one. Alex. Thank you very much, Luca. I'll, I'll give a brief answer in the interest of time. So I think that the major success of, of Zephyr and HTME, and one of the real successes for light mobility worldwide, is the taxi operations in Paris with with 600 vehicles um, in operation now? You know, really you know, a, a sizable number, and of course that has positive implications for the infrastructure because the stations are well utilised. Um, there's enough demand to support multiple stations, so there are stations at the different airports in Paris and and elsewhere that starts to create a viable network uh, with redundancy, high reliability, and and of course lower hydrogen prices because the the assets are being well utilized so that to me is a is a real success case where where paris has been successful in, in achieving a, a critical mass of the vehicles and infrastructure and i would say the same thing um applies to to heavy duty that there needs to be a a, a coordinated rollout of, of the vehicles and the stations and to get to that uh, a critical mass where the stations work well with with high utilization and low prices and you get into that um, positive feedback um, loop. So that to me is a success. And then and just quickly on the challenges, I, I spoke to them in, in the presentation, but an additional one I wanted to, to bring out was the competition is, is not standing still. These projects often begun when, for example, Nissan Leafs had a 160 kilometer range and, and were completely unsuitable for, for long distance mobility or, or taxi applications. And in, in the time of these projects, we now have 
vehicles with five or 600 kilometer ranges, solutions for people without um, off street parking uh, in, in cities and so on. And of course, a, an energy chain that's more efficient and, and um, relatively lower cost. And I see that challenge also applying with the heavy duty vehicles that these vehicles are being planned against battery electric alternatives that, that have currently limited range. But five years from now or 10 years from now, that, that technology will advance and hydrogen will need to continue reducing cost and improving the, the, the customer offer um, to, to represent a, a, a viable and uh, um, a attractive alternative to, to battery electric as diesel and the other ones gradually get, get banned as, as part of the energy transition. Yeah, great point, last one indeed, because uh, we are still competing not only against uh, ourselves, but also against electric vehicles, that is the alternative. And in some cases, like the case of the rails, we'll still compete, unfortunately, against diesel trains. So, yeah, we don't have to forget that. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you. Uh, I think that's it in terms of questions from the audience. Then, uh, to conclude this session, I believe we have seen a group of all pioneering projects in their aspects, and we do need their contribution. We do need to see the results at the end of it uh, in order to understand the impact of this, of the fuel sector technology, and whether the fuel sector technology eventually can be suitable for the transport application in a positive business case that it would be self-sustainable in the future. Just three, uh, yeah, three key elements that have come out of the session. One, I believe, is that the technology of the fuel cell is proving to be reliable for uh, several applications that we've seen, uh, like the case of cars, trains, aircraft, and also for port operation. So that is a very positive aspect. On the other hand, the HRS improvement is still needed uh, in terms of the technology, pretty much for all transport modes, uh, because this would ensure uh, business continuity and uh, the high utilization of HRSs is needed in order to do that. And the redundancy of the HRS is also a key for the development of the business case. Uh, and I would say, especially in the case of road transport. The third conclusion, uh, the business, the overall business is still sensitive to market conditions that could affect energy prices of electricity and therefore of hydrogen as well. Um, and also it could affect the supply chain in general. And in some cases, the lack of maturity of uh, some specific authorization processes could cause, is a cause of delays. Uh, for example, in the case of aviation, ships, and also rails. These are the three uh, key aspects that I want to bring out of the session. So uh, thank you very much to all the presenters, to all the participants that stayed online with us. Uh, don't forget to, uh, there will be more sessions at 11.30 on storage and building blocks, and also in the afternoon with uh, pre-normative research and the cross-cutting cross issues. Thank you very much again, and also don't forget, next week there's a Hydrogen Week in Brussels that is uh, free for you to enter. Thank you very much. I close the session here.